everybody. Welcome to the Nimoy Studio and the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Conversation on Race and the Memory of Evil with Susan Neiman and Brenda Stevenson. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you all back to the Hammer Museum for some upcoming programs and exhibitions. We recently opened an exhibition called Belonging, which looks at black American life through the domestic realm as places where intimacy, family, and personal identity interact with broader issues of class, race, and politics. Tomorrow night, we have a talk on public libraries with Susan Orlean and Roxane Gay. This Friday night, we start our Constitution Happy Hour series, which is kind of like a book club discussion where we read and discuss passages from the Constitution, but with booze and with leading constitutional scholars who are uh, taking, guiding us through the Constitution. So they're really great. We've done this once before as a series, and it's fantastic. Um, and tonight is the first of three programs we're doing to mark 400 years of slavery in the United States beginning when the ship, the White Lion, landed in Virginia in August 1619, carrying with it 20 men and women from Angola who were traded as slaves for the first time on our soil. 400 years later, the consequences of that immoral beginning are still plaguing our society. So we have three programs this fall to discuss some facets of this history, organized in conjunction with Dr. Brenda Stevenson, professor of American history here at UCLA. And tonight is one, and we're gonna talk about that more at a, in a moment. Um, and by the way, there's postcards in the back of the room with all of these programs on it that say 400 years of inequality on the front and then describe the programs on the back. Um, the, on November 12th, we'll have a panel discussion led by Dr. Stevenson on a practical guide to reparations. What if we as a nation decided to try and confront our past history with slavery? What would that actually look like? And I think making that real and tangible might help some people sort of overcome their fear of going down that path. Um, and the third program is a screening of the film Sankofa about a black, a modern black woman who's drawn back in time to live in the body of a slave on a southern plantation. And we'll have a discussion after the film with the director, Haile Jirima, and Dr. Stevenson. So we have lots going on here at The Hammer, and we'd love to have you all back. Museum admission is free, and admission to our public programs is also always free. So back to tonight's discussion, which is the first of our three-part series on 400 years of inequality. As William Faulkner said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And that perhaps is where Susan Neiman's book begins. She compares how two countries have dealt with their shameful past, Germany in the aftermath of the Holocaust and the United States in the aftermath of slavery. People would like to believe that slavery was so long ago that it's no longer relevant, that it doesn't affect us, that we have no responsibility for something that happened so long ago. But yet we have young men marching in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, just 100 miles from the part port where the white lion landed to keep a monument erected to glorify a man who fought for the right to buy and sell human beings if he's, as if he was some kind of national hero. We still have massive wealth inequality, largely due to redlining tactics that have kept black people out of the real estate market that's a major source of inherited wealth in our country. And of course, the current school to prison pipeline originated as a racist response to reconstruction. So the repercussions of slavery are right in front of our eyes every day if we only open our eyes. Susan Neiman's book explores how Germany confronted its shameful past through various forms of reparations and reconciliation and suggests there may be some guidelines that we as a country could try to follow to address some of our own shameful past so we can finally move forward together. So that's the topic of our discussion tonight. Um, just to give you a little background, Susan Neiman is an American moral philosopher, cultural commentator, and essayist. She studied philosophy at Harvard and at the Free University of Berlin, and was a professor of philosoph philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv universities. And she's written extensively on the juncture between enlightenment moral philosophy, metaphysics, and politics. She currently lives in Germany, where she's the director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam. Her previous books, translated into many languages, include why Grow Up? Subversive Questions for an Infantile Age. Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists. Evil in Modern Thought, An Alternative History of Philosophy. The Unity of Reason. And Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin. And her new book, which we're discussing tonight, is called Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil. And we have copies of the book available for sale tonight, and she'll be signing copies, and we also have copies of Brenda Stevenson's books. Brenda Stevenson is an internationally recognized scholar of race, slavery, gender, 
family and racial conflict, the ways in which race and gender interact, intersect, collide with, emphasize, run parallel to, and sometimes isolate one another are at the center of her work. Her book-length publications include the journals of Charlotte Fortin Grimke, Life in Black and White, Family and Community in the Slave South, The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlins, Justice, Gender, and the Origins of the LA Riots, and What is Slavery? Professor Stevenson's research has garnered numerous prizes, including the James Rawley Prize from the Organization of American Historians for the best book on race relations, the Ida B. Wells Barnett Award for Bravery in Journalism, and the Gustavus Meyer Outstanding Book Prize for Life in Black and White. Professor Stevenson is the past chair of the Departments of History and the Interdepartmental Program in African American Studies at UCLA. She's a distinguished lecturer for both the Organization of American Historians and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And she serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of African American History, the Journal of Black Studies, and the Journal Women, Gender, and Families of Color. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Neiman and Dr. Brenda Stevenson. Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming out. Um, it is lovely to see you all in this new space at the Hammer for this first program that we are having that commemorates, um, in some way, fashion, or shape, the 400 years since 1619. Um, it is my honor to have this discussion today with Susan. Um, I had a good time reading her book. I learned a lot of things, and I enjoyed it um, very much. And I think you all will enjoy what she has to say about it. We were just sitting in the back talking. We had never met before. But when we read each other's biographies, we realized that our paths had crossed, sort of, you know. Pretty close. Uh, pretty close um, in the past. She's a Southerner. I'm a Southerner. Uh, although you're from the Deep South, and I'm from the Upper South. And she taught at Yale, and I was a graduate student at Yale. And she um, lives in Berlin, one of the places that she has lived, and for some time. The longest place The I've longest lived, place yeah. that she's lived. And I've s spent some time in Berlin a couple of times, five months at one point at the American Academy in Berlin, and then um, the last... Uh, summer, I, spring, I taught at the University of Augsburg for six weeks. So, um, so we ha I have this interest in Germany as well. And of course, we share, I think, a real passion for trying to understand race in the world, okay, and the way in which we understand it or don't understand it or count it or discount it, right? And so um, I think it's an incredible... Um, an incredible project that you have. And one of the things is we were talking about how we were both afraid to stop the car driving through Mississippi when my husband drove me to my first teaching job at the University of Texas and when you were driving through, we, we just wouldn't stop. We just kept going. We just like, no, you can't use the bathroom. You can't get water, nothing. Just get through Mississippi. Okay, and so so we realize that. Um, so we have this, I think, so also, of course, we're probably about the same generation, same gender, I, I think, and... Um, you know, I'd say no. definitely. You're okay, <laughs> all right, okay. We didn't give our pronouns, so I wasn't sure, but at any rate, I think that we are, um, and, um, and so we, we share a lot of things. So I want you to tell me, um, we're both mothers. We are both mothers, and we both have daughters, too. Which, you have a son? I have a son, too. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't have a son. Okay. Um, the other thing is when I moved to, I was very reticent to move to Germany. You know, I, I got this award, and I thought, I'm not going to go to Germany. Okay. I just don't want to go. In fact, halfway through applying for the American Academy in Berlin, I said, I'm not going to finish my application. And then they called me right before the deadline and said, we see that you haven't finished your application. Are you going to finish it? And I didn't really want to tell the woman, no, I don't want to come to Germany. You know, so I said, okay, I'll finish it. <laughs> I did. But, and all my friends said, what the hell are you 
you going to Germany for? You know, because in the United States, we still have this image of Germany. And, you know, in a particular kind of way. I mean, I grew up, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and Germany was still, you know, we just thought of Nazis, and we thought of the Holocaust, and we thought of, you know, and in, in the segregated South, you know, um, you know, Jewish people were friendly to black people, you know. And so we thought, oh, my gosh, these people in Germany killed all of our Jewish friends, you know. And so I really didn't want to go. But then I went, and I... And I told my husband, I said, well, I'm going to go. If I don't like it, I'm going to come back. But I don't want them to say that I wouldn't go, okay? So I went, and I loved it. I loved Berlin. And so I kept thinking, why was I so wrong about Berlin, though? You know, and even my friends, when I went back to Oxford this summer, they look at me like, you're going back to Germany, huh? <laughs> you know, sort of like, what's wrong with you, lady? So I want you to tell me, because you write about, you know, that this was a kind of a surprising experience for you to go there to decide that this was a safe place to raise your children, um, which, of course, is the most important thing that we think about. So tell me how you came to that decision and how that inspired you to write this book. So let me take it back just a little bit further because mm -hmm. um, there's a sense, I realize, in which I've been writing this book all my life life, although I've written a number of other books. Um, I was born in Atlanta. Uh, when I was two years old, our synagogue was bombed by the Klan. And my mother was very involved in the school desegregation campaign. Um, we were not real deep Southerners. My parents were from Chicago. But they went the other way. And so um, I actually hated being from the South and <laughs> wanted to uh, leave and go to New York or Europe, of which I had no real idea of, uh, as soon as possible. But now, of course, um, I am really glad that I grew up in a moment where it seemed very clear there's good, there's evil, there's progress. And these are not contested concepts. These are not problematic, you know? Um, there was a sense of moral clarity and the sense that ordinary people, my mother was a housewife um, who had worked in advertising, so she had some media skills. But um, she wasn't intellectual, she wasn't a, you know, a politician, she was just, anyway, and other people like her could actually create change for the better. So I'm glad I had that background. Um, and I think, that may have something, that I wouldn't have said it at the time, of course, but the fact that I decided to study philosophy after a long kind of circuitous route and um, decided to study moral and political philosophy, I, I, I think that probably grew there. So in 1981, I'm writing a dissertation on uh, uh, Immanuel Kant and <laughs> If you think it was hard for you to come to Germany in 2016, imagine what people said in 1982. I mean, there really were very few Americans unless they were part of the army mm -hmm. uh, and virtually no Jews. Mm -hmm. And um, my response when people said, what's a nice Jewish girl doing going to a place like that for a whole year? I had a Fulbright Fellowship um, and I thought it was going to be a year. Um, and I said, look, it's 40 years after the war. Um, it's, uh, isn't it just as racist to blame the whole German nation um, you know, for crimes of the past uh, as it would be for the Germans to have uh, blamed the Jews? I'm going to Berlin. I'm going to think about Kant and Goethe, and that's that. And I come to Berlin, and I realize the war is completely present. Um, this may be true about me, um, but every decent young German, I mean young, I mean anywhere between 20 and 40, um, is obsessed mm -hmm. with the Nazi period. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually at that point, and, and in very moving ways, so it was at, at that point that I realized, um, oh, wait a second, I, and I already began thinking you know, it would be interesting if Americans paid the same kind of attention and felt the same kind of shame. Um, so I was think I've been thinking about the subject for a long time, but this book actually had a particular genesis and a particular moment. I was standing in my apartment in Berlin, tears running down my face, watching President Obama give the eulogy in Charleston. 
And it was not just that eulogy, but it was the fact that right after that, Nikki Haley, of all people, took down the Confederate flag, and Walmart said they were you know, not going to sell Confederate memorabilia anymore. And I thought, OK, um, I have some real experience in this question. Maybe there's a book that I could write that would be useful. And at the same time, just a couple of months later, the German public let in a million refugees. And it's not just that they let them in, and it's Angela Merkel got both the praise and the blame for this. Um, she waited 12 days to see which way the wind was blowing, and she always does. She's not a politician with an awful lot of principle, um, as you may know from having <laughs> spent some time there. Um, but you had thousands of people literally coming to the train stations, you know, with signs that said welcome and, you know, clothes and food and spending their time teaching the new immigrants German and playing music or soccer with them, you know, and that's still going on. Although there's been pushback, that's still going on. Um, to this day, and there are more people who are actively involved in refugee integration than voted for our right-wing party. So that's just something that people should know, exactly. And so I thought, um, I'll, you know, this would be something perhaps that I could do that's useful. Meanwhile, of course, we know the political winds um, changed dramatically. At the same time, I got a letter, because I had written a short, I mean, it was like a prologue to this book. It, hadn't become a book, it was just an article. And I get this letter from this guy who I actually thought was an old um, Mississippian. He turned out to be a 33-year-old lawyer, but um, he writes me this letter saying, um, you know, I found your article really interesting, and now I'd like some advice. Should we rename all our streets? Um, what do you think we should do with monuments? Um, and he said, I'm a conservative white Mississippian, but I don't think I'm a racist, and I really honestly want to know what we should do with this history. And I wrote back saying, um, you know, if all conservative white Americans are uh, as thoughtful as you are, then we're in better shape than I thought. But um, I did think he invited me to come um, and give a talk he said, I, you should come give a talk at my alma mater, the University of Mississippi, known as Ole Miss, except it's not okay to call it Ole Miss. You'll find out when you go there. Um, it's, you know, but that's okay. Um, we don't have to go into that. And I wound up at something called the William Winter Institute for Recon Racial Reconciliation. And I, I was terrifically impressed with the work that they were doing, small institute, um, about 12 staff, half black, half white, um, doing a lot of really interesting programs. And I thought, you know, I do think Americans have something to learn uh, from the Germans, but I better see what people are doing on the ground first, you know, it doesn't to lecture to people without any. And Mississippi seemed like, for all of our um, mutual fear about crossing the state line, um, I don't ever want to be uh, understood as saying racism is only a problem in the South. It's not. Right. But I see the South, and Mississippi in particular, as a magnifying glass. And um, first of all, because uh, Mississippians are so conscious of their history, they get it wrong, mm -hmm. but you can't possibly say they don't think about their history. They think about it all the time. And secondly, they have to think about race because there are a lot of African Americans there. Right. And, you know, there, I mean, in other places where I've lived, um, Cambridge, Mass, um, you know, New York, parts of Princeton, Lord knows, despite Toni Morrison, God. Uh, rest her wonderful soul. Um, you know, I, uh, you can avoid it, and you can't avoid it in Mississippi. So I asked uh, the people at the Winter Institute if I could come back and spend half a year there. I said, you know, I have a sabbatical coming. You don't have to pay me anything. I just want to follow you around and <laughs> learn from you. I mean, as it turned out, I 
taught a course and you know did various things there too. But um, so that's um, that's a long answer to your question. But that's I hope it okay. was. It's a long, intriguing answer. But I want to ask you, um, how did people take to you in Germany doing this kind of research? Um, and particularly when you began to ask the question about the differences that um, East Germany uh, in their experience with the Holocaust versus West Germany. OK, I will. Those are two big questions, and I will try to um, answer them um, succinctly. So in a certain sense, again, I've been doing this research uh, ever since I came there I, and watching the ways in which Germans were trying and often failing uh, to deal with the Nazi period. And there's a huge difference between the way that people dealt with things, or the way people dealt with racism and internationalism at all between 1982 when I first went there and 2000 when I decided to go back. It was actually, it was interesting. I, was, I, I really was contemplating the question of whether I could bring my children there or not. And I was, had been offered this fantastic job. Um, and I wasn't, um, in a certain sense, kind of running, I mean, without the museum, but sort of running a series of programs like this. Um, and it gave me one foot in academia and one foot in the rest of the world, and that's something that I always wanted to have. But I wasn't sure about bringing uh, three small children who at that point um, were um, tel you know, Israeli. I mean, we'd been living in Tel Aviv for five years. Um, and I was walking across, this, everybody said there's a change of government and it's now the capital and it's much more international than it used to be and it's much more multicultural. And I was actually walking across the street and there was an African man wearing long dreadlocks and kind of a very bright dashiki and a car nearly cuts him off right in front of me. And uh, not intentionally. And um, he yells at the driver and he says, where did you get your driver's license, you, et cetera, et cetera. My daughter has told me it's not acceptable for women to swear in public in LA, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> News flash. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that? <laughs> But he did swear and said, where'd you get your driver's license, you so-and-so? And, -so. and uh, I suddenly thought, oh, when I lived there, uh, you know, more than a decade earlier, no foreigner would dare to talk back to a German on the street. This place is okay. It's really changed. You know, <laughs> you can sort of, you can feel okay. Um, so, in a certain sense, I've been kind of testing the waters and watching Germans' um, relationship to their past and to me and to Jews and to non-Germans um, for a long time. But when I started working on this book, um, the main reaction that I got from my German friends and colleagues was laughter. Um, learning from the Germans? Are you kidding? And um, one person actually who was a minister of culture and was I was having dinner with him, he starts yelling at me in a restaurant, you cannot publish a book with that title. <laughs> because for good Germans, the line is, we didn't do enough and what we did was too late and there's still racism and anti-Semitism in this country and we cannot possibly be an example to other people. It took me actually until getting to Mississippi to realize that's actually why we can learn from them. Because the first thing that we have to learn is it's really hard. Mm -hmm. It is really hard to shave, to face up to a shameful, violent past. Even if you're a Nazi, mm -hmm. even if you're a Nazi, it's 
going to, there's going to be pushback. Mm -hmm. There's going to be even perhaps violence. Um, and of course, Newt Gingrich is going to go on about the 1619 project. That's what Nazis did. Right. Yeah. You know, um, for years and years and years in the West. Right. Now we get to the second. So, so the first problem I'm going to have in when the book comes out in German will be with the title. Um, and the second <laughs> will be is that I argue that um, at least in the beginning, in the long beginning, the first 40 years or so after the war, the East Germans did a better job than the West Germans. Uh, there's a reason for that. The uh, Nazis' first victims were not Jews. They were Germans and they were communists. And then they were German social democrats. And, you know, a lot of people know that Niemöller quote, first they came for the communists and then I wasn't a communist and then they came for the social Well, this was true. And there are quotes from Hitler saying his real mission was uh, to fight communism. And that's why a lot of people who weren't really Nazis and weren't racist supported him and thought it would be a good thing if you know he got rid of communists on the one side and those Anglo-American utilitarians on the other side. So what that meant is when the war was over, the people who became the leaders of the GDR were really anti-fascists. They had spent the war either in a concentration camp as a political prisoner or they had gone into exile. Um, usually in Moscow. And when they came back, they really were anti-fascists. They were not, as it was true in the West, um, people who had either gone along or aside from the very top levels of government, people who'd been Nazis. And they, you know, you can look at um, the monuments that they raised to um, the people who defeated fascism to the resistance members and you know you can just see the difference in the city if you know how to look at it. Um, they instrumentalized the anti-fascism sometime but um, it was very different, very different um, narrative. So. Well that's really interesting because I think most people really don't think that much much about um, East Germany, but they think about the Stasi, for example. And when I was in Berlin, people talked about how bad the Stasi were in compared to what state police. Is that what they are? Right? As in East Germany as compared to the Nazis. Um, in the United States, when we talk about you know slavery and we talk about reconstruction and all of that, there is also a divide, and it's the South and everybody else. So people say, as you alluded to, that racism is worse in the South, that slavery really occurred. But the part about slavery occurring in the South is true, although the South is very big, at, you know, at the at the height of the institution. And so people would always say, is it they said about Abraham Lincoln that, you know, who liber supposedly liberated the slaves. Well, you know, slavery was, the people in the South are the ones who are guilty. You know, they are the ones who didn't, um, uh, they were the ones who had the slaves, they were the ones who benefited from the slaves, they were the ones who, you know, instituted, um, um, Jim Crow legislation, lynching took place largely in the South, et cetera, et cetera. But we know indeed that um, the entire nation is racist and that the entire nation, um, you know, benefited from enslavement and uh, from the colonial period forward. Um, and that the entire, and that Jim Crow actually existed outside of the South prior to the Civil War and then it was in, used by the South afterwards to control the, the, the movement and the spaces and the culture and the expression of, uh, of black people, but it had already been implemented throughout the Northeast, the Midwest, the West, even California, yes, even California. And so um, I'm wondering, you know, uh, when people read your, your book from um, the United States, Will they question this kind of divide 
um, that we see in the book about East Germany versus West Germany and their handling of the situation because that same kind of um, um, sort of decision about who was worse or who, um, you know, existed, uh, it exists in this country too. So that opens up a whole bunch of good questions. Um, I mean, the thing about the Stasi, which is the only thing that most people outside Germany know about East Germany at this mm -hmm. point, um, and it's a point I make in the book, look, um, the Stasi wasn't a good thing, uh, you know, nobody thinks it was, but um, whatever you think of Edward Snowden, I mean, you know, he uncovered some uh, information that is extremely problematic, but nobody, even his most passionate supporters, nobody thinks of re reducing the entire United States to what Ed Edward Snowden found out about the uh, the NSA. So you know, it's just it's just crazy to take this one point about the South and the North. I'm sure you know Edward Baptist's wonderful book, The Half mm -hmm. Has Never Been Told, mm -hmm. which taught me a lot about the way in which, and I quote it extensively from it, the way in which um, all of American prosperity was uh, founded on slavery in surprising ways. What I think is more disturbing is the way that the lost cause narrative um, really took over the country where in Hollywood, it's not just birth of a nation and gone with the wind. I looked this up, there's a huge number of Hollywood films. Right. Shirley Temple, The Littlest Rebel, I mean there's just, there's a huge number of films um, that all valorize the Confederacy and here's my new epiphany. I wonder what you think about it, because this may have been obvious to you, but I was about half a year ago, no, maybe it was a year ago, I was in the States, I was driving down the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, put on the radio, song I really like comes on, the night they drove old Dixie down. Oh. Right. <laughs> Written by Dylan's band. I mean, Dylan went down to Mississippi in 64. Dylan is okay. and covered by Joan Baez, right. who was in Selma. I mean, there's no, you know, and I'm sitting here and I think, I can't sing this song anymore. What if I were listening to a song with a great tune, you know, the, the chorus of which was, you know, the night they drove the Wehrmacht down, right. you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it seeps into our culture in ways that I've been working on this stuff and I didn't realize it until the song came on the radio and I can't sing that anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. No, it is a big part of, you know, c the culture. We know that, you know, I've written on actually slavery in film and how the first films really focused on slavery, you know, and it focused on slavery from the perspective of the slaveholder, that is, from those people who, you know, uh, the, most of the black people were, you know, it looked ridiculous. Um, a lot of the people were in blackface, um, et cetera. So if we look at, you know, um, one of the first films, of course, is Uncle Tom's Cabin. And there's so many versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin, but it comes as the Edison version of it. And so we begin to see replicated very quickly, you know, um, the notion that the South was a good place, that um, this was a place where there was gentility, where uh, power was had by those people who knew what to do with it and everybody else needed, were dependents of them and that kind of thing. That's very much a part of the way in which the film industry begins. And so it's not just as you say, Gone with the Wind. I mean, it's, it's many, many, many films before Gone with the Wind. And indeed, what I thought, one of the things is just aside, uh, Frank Yerby, who is the first African-American uh, novelist to have a film, um, his novel turn into a film in Hollywood, is about the Old South. His novel is about the Old South. Um, and so, and it replicates also some of these images of Southern gentility, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. But just to get back to what we were talking about um, previous to this, do you think uh, that Southerners or people in the United States are ready to listen to Germany 
about how to deal with race. I mean, even though it's been, you know, 80 years um, almost, um, but are people, have people forgotten enough, forgiven enough, um, been impressed enough with Germany's recovery with regard to race um, to say, oh, they have some, they've done some things that we need to do. Um, because you have people in the United States who really feel still that we are the nation that represents you know, freedom and liberty and equality. And while we, you know, and we have not embraced the annihilation of indigenous people. We have not embraced the long-term impact of slavery. We have not embraced the ways in which we treated immigrants at the turn of the 20th century and today. So, you know, we've, we haven't come to terms with those things ourselves. So, and we haven't accepted that we've been you know, uh, that we've acted in bad faith and, and bad morality um, in these particular incidences and it's had incredible um, negative impact on large parts of our population. Are we ready to listen to Germany? Are we ready to say, oh, you know, those people who killed, you know, millions of people in World War II are not going to show us what we should do? So, um, I would have exactly had the same question, and um, the title of the book is meant to be provocative, and it is. And, and the title of the book, again, is Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil. Okay. And um, right before it came out a month ago, I actually uh, asked my business manager to um, get my email off of our institute website because uh, I don't do social media, so I don't have to worry about that. But I was sure that I was going to get various kinds of hate mail and I just figured I don't need, you know, let let somebody else screen it first. I actually had a friend that this happened to, published a book a year ago, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. It's a good book. And she... <laughs> And, and, and she got, I mean, she's a, she's a professor of uh, women's uh, studies and Slavic studies in uh, University of Pennsylvania. It's not a, you know, it's, uh, she's a serious scholar, but it's also a catchy title. And um, she got slammed and got all kinds of, you know, awful, so she said, this is what you have to do. I have so far, it may change, I have only gotten really nice, letters from very different people. Uh, Deborah Lipstadt, who's a senior Holocaust scholar, mm -hmm. um, you don't get to pick your reviewers at the New York Times, as I'm sure you know, but if they'd asked, I would not have picked her. Um, she wrote a glowing review of the book. And that plus some other things that I'm watching about the country, have led me to a conclusion which I do hope is not too optimistic, but um, I think there's a silver lining in this horrible presidency. And the silver lining is that it has caused white Americans to be aware of how deep white supremacy runs in this country. Um, you know, it's not that we didn't know anything, you know, there's slavery, but yeah, then we fought a civil war. It was a, yes, there was segregation, but then there was a civil rights movement. And I, it's not that I thought or any other intelligent person thought, you know, when President Obama was elected, it's a post-racial nation, but it did seem, the arc of the universe seemed to, seemed to be bending in the mm -hmm. right way, right? And um, the shock of the election of this <laughs> I, I mean I you know what can we say? <laughs> I, I, I'm not really sure he qualifies for the word person. I mean this is a you know philosophers talk about personhood and what you have to be to be a person. But anyway um, his his election or non-election, you know, uh, was but it was so clearly fueled by a backlash to the fact that you can disagree with this or that of President Obama's policies, but for eight years, 
we had a black family in the White House who did not make one false move, who were shining examples of grace and integrity and hard work and intelligence, and it drove some people nuts. And I think that, you know, white America has suddenly been saying to itself, oh boy, this, you know, this is worse than we thought it was. I mean, a couple of instances of this, um, you know, if you heard the word white supremacy two years ago, you were probably in a department of post-colonial studies, <laughs> right? I mean, you were not reading it in the New York Times or the Washington Post, okay? I mean, you might hear racism, but you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and suddenly, you have things like the 1619 Project, which is not just commemorating slavery, it's saying we need to retell the history of this country from the perspective of slavery. The other thing that I think is amazing, so I knew I was gonna have to write about reparations, and I left that for next to last. Right. And I wasn't 100% sure what I thought about reparations. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I'm sure you know, you often write a book to figure out exactly what you think about certain problems. Um, you know, you don't know everything you think before you finish it. And I, I mean, there are some um, African-American scholars who I really respect, like Cornel West and Adolf Reed, mm -hmm. who'd come out very strongly against uh, reparations. reparations. Mm -hmm and said, no, what we need is social democracy. Well, I think we need social democracy too, mm -hmm. uh, living in a socially democratic, structured um, part of the world. But, um, you know, I started thinking, you know, would we tell a Holocaust survivor, you know, that just the same social rights, they don't call them benefits in Europe, they call them rights, uh, healthcare, education, labor rights, vacation, parental leave, those are just rights, not benefits. Um, but, you know, supposing you had a Holocaust survivor who just got the same uh, rights as everybody else, wouldn't we think they were owed something different? So I, I work my way, something more, so I work my way through this argument, I come out strongly in favor of reparations, right. um, and I think, boy, have I put myself out on a line. You know, it's me and Tana Hazy Coates, and um, you know, it, this is this is really going to you know people who've agreed with me so far have you know will say okay she's gone too far this is good you know this is this is way too much and you know I didn't dream that five months later you would have five presidential candidates we'll talk discussing. About it. Right. or that we would have hearings in the House of Representatives. And that has gone so fast. Um, and I really do think, to answer your question in what I think is a hopeful way, I do think that the horrible presidency that we're uh, subject to has had um, an effect that, yes, Americans are even willing to learn from the Germans. Okay. Well, you, you talk about reparations, and also in the book, you talk about the kind of arc of, um, of the, the arc of the movement in the United States, in the South, and you're focusing particularly on Mississippi, but you, you know, you want us, of course, to think about other places in the United States as well, and you spend a lot of time when you do that talking about Emmett Till. Okay, and, and the way in which people respond still today to the Emmett's um, Till um, kidnapping and torture and murder. And, um, and of course, we think about Emmett Till, uh, we also think about Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Latasha Harlins and Tamir Rice and so many other people. Um, and that has pushed us, thankfully, to have our Black Lives Matter movement, to have Say Her Name movement, um, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit for us, and I think this will probably be the last question, but talk a little bit to us about how people approach the notion of recovery and reconciliation and reparations generationally. I mean, that is, 
we have several generations represented in this audience. Of course, nationally we do, but generationally, you know, too. Um, and are there, is there enough connective tissue between these generations to allow us to have an effective movement? So some people think that what happened in Germany was a generational change. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, the children and of the Nazis, you know, grew up to you know till about 1968, and suddenly realized their parents and teachers had been Nazis or at least bystanders, mm -hmm. and were horrified. And um, actually, that's what the 60s meant in Germany. It wasn't uh, flower power or, um, you know, even the war in Vietnam. It was um, daddy and, um, you know, your teachers in school that they were, you know, who had been real Nazis. But generational change would not have been enough. It was not in any way automatic. Mm -hmm. It had to be people working seriously um, in, you know, little civil society, you know, people researching the history of their neighborhoods, um, you know, making film, mm -hmm. writing songs, uh, reading, uh, different kinds of things. So it was work. And I certainly saw that work in the Delta, I, I, was, I was based in Oxford, Mississippi, which they call in Mississippi the Velvet Ditch, as in it's you know nicer and more civilized than other parts of Mississippi, which is true, although it has its own problems, believe me. And it's small. It's small, it's, it's a pretty. small part in It's very pretty. Um, <laughs> but I, I did spend quite a bit of time in the Delta, staying there um, in the town where Emmett Till's murderers were tried and acquitted, mm -hmm. and going to the sites which are still contested exactly where he was murdered and where they found his body. And, you know, it's a really interesting mix. On the one side, you have the Emmett Till Commission, which is um, deliberately it's composed of citizens of the Delta, um, half black, half white, um, who work to get the courthouse restored, who have a little museum. There are actually two museums dedicated to Emmett Till, 17 miles from each other. It's a funny story, kind of, I tell it in the book. Um, so, you know, and, and people come and they give tours and they, um, the Till family sometimes comes down there. They made an official apology to the Till family, you know, and argued over every single word of the apology, and there was a lot of controversy about that. And it's quite moving mm -hmm. to see that and to talk to the very different people who are, it's still very alive there. I mean, I interviewed both um, the son of the um, the lawyer who defended the murderers, and boy, if he isn't in the Klan, he sure, you know, talks like one. I mean, that was the one really scary situation <laughs> that I was in. Um, but I also talked to the son of the African American worker for the murderers, and he worked for one of the murderers, and was forced to be an accomplice to the murder. And it's not quite sure what he did, but you know, you think of being a capo, in a, a Jewish capo in a concentration camp. You either, um, you know, instruct, you know, you, you, you cover up the bodies, or you be killed, you become a body yourself. So. So I, you know, I, I talk to all to these people, not the son of the defense attorney. He's not trying to do any form of reconciliation whatsoever. But the other people really are in these complicated. We talked about the friendliness of summer, right. Southerners, which is weird given mm -hmm. the other things in their history. But they just really are 
friendly. Can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. They can do a lot of other things, but um, they're that. But at the same time, so this Emmett Till Commission put up a series of markers, mm -hmm. um, and they now have an audio, If should you ever be interested in going there, but you can also, I think, just do it online. There's a... Uh, there's an app that goes through the stages of his journey. And they put up these signs at the various points, and the signs have been shut up. They were shut up seven times, and the director of the center um, took the sign, one of the signs down and put it in his parents' garage, which happened to be <laughs> behind the apartment that I was renting in Oxford, which was funny, because I would see this shot up sign all the time. And nobody knew who'd done it, and you thought, okay, it's the Delta. Um, you know, s there are people who live there who are poor, redneck, whatevers. Mm -hmm. But just, was it a month or two ago, um, some University of Mississippi students shot up the sign and posted a picture of themselves grinning on their social media. Mm. And so you have to, you know, it's, it's still happening. It's still continuous. Mm -hmm. um, just like it's still happening in Germany. I mean, this right. is, it's not the case. People tear up the stumbling stones, right. the yeah. monuments too. That, mm -hmm. that happens. I, I interviewed uh, one of my heroes, Brian Stevenson, for, oh. for mm -hmm. this um, book. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons, I mean, the only reason really that I felt um, that I had the right to interrupt, you know, his saving people's lives, which is mostly what he does with his time, um, was that he was the only American that I had, you know, heard or seen who says he was inspired by what he saw in Germany, that his whole work for the National Lynching M Memorial mm -hmm. was inspired by Germany. And uh, I talked to him about it, and I talked about, you know, shooting up the Emmett Till signs, and what do you think, you know, what does this mean? And he said, you know, it's better that there should be signs that are shot up or destroyed than that there shouldn't be anything, mm -hmm. um, because this is a process, and you don't get rid of racism, you know, by saying, uh, boy, I'm sorry, that was a bad, bad move. Um, you know, try not to do it again. It's a very deep process that the German nation is still going through um, and that I think we will be going through for a long time. But I do think we've started. I just want to, I know I was going to end after that question, but I have one other question, and then we're opening up for questions from the audience. One of the things that struck me when I was reading your book, and the fact that I'm a Southern historian and African American historian, I knew this from the other side, was that when we talk about the Holocaust, we're talking about genocide, um, you know, physical genocide or, and removal, absenteeing an entire group of people, all right, in, in several countries. And when we talk about slavery and Jim Crow, we're talking about things that, you know, economic um, genocide and political and all that, but people are still here, you know, and the black population has just continued to grow since 1619 forward. There has not been a time, even though there have been attempts you know, through poor medical attention and experimentation and bombing and, of course, incarceration and all these other kinds of things, sterilization, to control the black population, its growth, to destroy it. There was an attempt to, of course, remove black people through the colonization movements, one of uh, also Abraham Lincoln's plans, too, of course, associated with that. But black people continued to live in this country after the Civil War, at the height of slavery, at the height of this, you know, uber oppressive um, system. Indeed, black people were encouraged, or if, and even some made, to have children. Um, and so our numbers increased and continue to increase. Our presence is here 
is still still felt seen, um, even though segregation you know obliterated some of that. So is there a way that, in terms of looking at the German model, the differences that, in terms of the United being uh, what the United States can look at, adopt, that has to adjust for the fact that you know they were adjusting to the, in some ways, the absence, the destruction of a group of people, whereas in the United States, um, the, us, we were still here. We didn't disappear. Complicated question, I'll try to make it short. Okay, um, it's the last one, I promise, <laughs> okay. I, I do, in the first chapter of the book, mm -hmm. I talk about all the differences between the German case and the American case. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're a historian, you know, no two historical situations all are identical. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think morally, mm -hmm. there are important, I mean, I read a lot of history and I do what I can, but I'm trained as a philosopher. Right. And morally, I think the parallels are important. Now, it's not true that there are no Jews in Germany today. It's actually the fastest growing Jewish no, community. I didn't, I didn't mean that there are no Jews. I would just meant that at the, right after the Holocaust, right. there were very few. Right. And then um, the numbers have been small, growing but small, as compared to African Americans. The totally numbers have been right. large. And, you know, that presents both um, problems and promises. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, you know, I've thought about Black Lives Matter and what I would think if, you know, the police were somehow still shooting unarmed Jews. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, right. that would be a very different situation. Right. Or, um, you know, following us around in department stores or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I do see that, you know, the fact that there, is it 14%, 13%, 14% of the population is African American? Right. yes. Um, that that means that there's ongoing uh, really acute problems mm -hmm. that aren't being addressed, so it isn't just talking about the past. On the other hand, and I don't know what you think about this, but um, it is impossible to imagine American culture without African American culture. Of course. And or wealth. I, yeah, well, let, let's even leave that aside. I agree. I need to talk <laughs> about the money. No, you do, you do. <laughs> and, so. and, and, uh, but we'll stay with the culture for well, a minute. No, it's, it's just that, and, and of course, you know, Jewish Germans had a big impact on German culture too. Right, But definitely. they're not still there. I, I mean, they're, they're coming back. Mm -hmm. There are 30,000 Israelis in Berlin. I mean, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, but... Um, they're not playing the role that African Americans have played, you know, since the middle of the 19th century mm -hmm. in creating America. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. 18th century. 18th century. Right. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. There are a few, but yeah. Yes. No. 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 I got okay, you. I don't want to. Okay. You know. But but. I mean, the impact is so gigantic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't, what, what I want to ask you how you feel about this, and this is controversial, my editor said, mm, don't touch it, but I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> when Toni Morrison died, I had to think back to when I came to Berlin in 1982, mm -hmm. and in West Berlin, I think one of the reasons that I liked East Berlin um, was that the first question they would always ask me is, oh, do you know Angela Davis? Um, <laughs> I don't know. And in West Berlin, um, it was America, Reagan, McDonald's. Um, Americans have no culture. That was the thing that I would hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And just to throw out, like, you know, the two first uh, names that I love that came into my head, I said, what about Bob Dylan and Toni Morrison? Mm -hmm. Not predicting that both of them would win. The Americas know about laureates sometime oh, down the road, but yeah, yeah they had, yeah. and they would say, Dylan, are you kidding? And that's pop, and um, Tony who, because she hadn't yet right. won the Nobel Prize. And I felt proud that those two writers were representing me mm -hmm. as an American. And when Morrison passed, I, 
I think I read all the appreciations, I mean, at least in the major publications, and some of them were very moving. I don't think I read one by a white writer. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that I would like to write one. I didn't have any time and I haven't done it yet. Um, because while I'd say, you know, perhaps the majority of the appreciation should be written by African-American women for whom Toni Morrison was just, you know, opened up worlds. But I felt like, no, she's also an American writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would like to see that expressed. Mm -hmm. And maybe I will um, get around to writing that piece. But I do think the fact that African-American stories are so woven in to the fabric of this country means, of course, it will be a different process. Right. But um, I think probably, you know, that, that relationship that Americans have to African-Americans or that African-Americans have to America um, will be a benefit and not a, uh, not a hindrance. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, I believe it's a part of the pro um, program where you can ask questions. And so there are people in the audience who have the microphones. And um, so please feel free to do so. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for that. Uh, and I guess my question was, um, did your research on Germany, um, I've had, did your research on Germany uh, give you any thoughts about the difficulty in dealing with things that aren't technically illegal. So, for example, you know, the people hiding Jews in Germany were committing crimes. The people taking them to the camps were not. Um, and in America, when we finally made slavery illegal, that was a crime. Um, racism was not. And racism, like, existed, you know, we, we kind of dialed in, you know, the, I guess, the circumference of what we were willing to deal with. And it becomes something very difficult, like, even today, where we're willing to talk about impeachment for maybe obstruction or collusion with Ukraine, but abuse of anybody who's not white, child separation, you know, family separation is not. And was, were there any lessons you were able to take from that where maybe in the aftermath they were able to expand that radius and suddenly be able to deal with the idea that this evil existed beyond this narrow definition and even if a law did not exist then, we want to go ahead and now punish that or somehow going forward at least deal with this? Well, if I understand your question properly, um, the singular achievement of the Nuremberg trials um, was to establish an international law that there's a higher law sometimes than the law of the land and that people are responsible to their consciences um, and not simply to what a fascist government has told them is legal and illegal. It's a very complicated ruling to apply, but honestly, you know, e every serious moral judgment <laughs> is you, you, you cannot give general rules. I mean, I'm a Kantian, and many people think that um, Kant said, you know, there are very strict rules that you can follow, and it churns out, you know, the right answer every time. Well, Kant scholars know that's not the case, actually. They have to, you know, you have, Kant's rules are very general. It's about respecting um, other human beings as persons, okay? 
um, and what it means to apply those rules in different situations. Some you're going to have to work out. I mean, you don't you don't get recipes. Um, you know, as far so, I um, I don't really see a problem. I think that. Um, some of the things this administration has done, um, I mean, good heavens, they've not only tried to rewrite the law, they've tried to rewrite Emma Lazarus, you know? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, uh, I think we ought to know, even in an age of, um, you know, Deceptive news. One can't use the word fake news anymore, can one? Um, you know, although if you have to watch Fox for a while, you know what it's about. Um, you know, I, I think that it's incumbent on those of us who do still try to think for ourselves, to use a Kantian term, um, you know, to think about what can be done. I actually just met a woman. Um, a doctor who'd spent a week in Tijuana. I forget the name of the organization. It's an American Jewish woman. Um, it was actually um, her synagogue had organized it. Um, and they're helping out people who are applying for asylum and they're giving them legal advice, but they're also, I mean, doing everything. It, it, uh, you know, from taking care of their babies to for moments while the parents are getting legal advice and tell their stories, you know, so the children don't have to listen to them going through this trauma again. Um, and she said after a week she could hardly take it, but they need volunteers, they need money. Um, you know, there are, thank heavens, there are American citizens who are um, doing that kind of uh, resistance work, and it's something we can all do. Uh, and I just wanted to add, too, that the laws indicate where we are as a society, okay, so that if you find that the laws are very narrow in terms of um, a moral compass, all right, that is an indicator, a strong indicator of where much of the nation is at the time. And so, you know, a lot of the abuse, a lot of the um, acts that have been, uh, that we now view as immoral, you know, at the time, the society did not view it as such, and it was reflected um, in the laws. So the laws have been used to create abusive situations and to clear up abusive situations too. And it is, it, 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 but I like your question because it does teach us a lot about where we are with our legal system, why the judiciary is so important, and why um, that is a front that we have to keep trying to make certain um, is focused on what we as a moral group of people would consider doing the right thing. I liked uh, your mentioning of the signage for Emmett Till and uh, that, uh, that that's been very provocative even when the signs are defaced. Throughout Berlin, we were especially struck uh, recently all the signage of history and, and hundreds of school, you know, high schools and school children from other countries going from place to place to place and reading about the history of this building or that and the brass cobblestones uh, that indicate where Jews were taken from this particular house or this particular office. And I think a lot more signage around America would be very helpful about what has been done uh, to black people. For example, I heard in the 60s, a black person could not rent an apartment, a student could not rent an apartment here in Westwood. So or an apartment owned by the Trumps. Pardon? Or an apartment owned by the Trumps. <laughs> But uh, let's say in Westwood, you were going to put up some signage well, uh, for uh, along the lines of reparations or it happened here. And that's just an example that I heard, that you could not rent an apartment. What, what's something learned from Germany that you might uh, represent on a sign here in Westwood for the edification of students? So um, I think this is the second time in my life that I've been in Westwood. And um, I don't like 
commenting on places that I don't know really well because I think all of this needs to be community-based. Um, but what I know that Brian Stevenson is doing, which you've probably seen pictures of his wonderful lynching memorial, the interesting thing is, um, and this is why he, one of the things he learned from Germany, it's not just this unbelievably striking and moving large place. There's this parallel set of columns and the idea is that communities, and they've already started doing it, where lynching took place, should come and claim their marker and take it back there so that, you know, every two miles in the south you see a sign for another Confederate battle site so that next to that will be um, a marker like that. But he told me something else, and I was really glad he said this, because I deeply believe we don't just need to remember our crimes, we also really need to remember our heroes. And he said, you know, there were white people in the South who were against slavery, uh, and we don't know their names. Uh, there were people who fought lynching, and you don't know their names. And there need to be um, markers of that as well. Um, so, you know, um, I mean, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, there are little markers to Cheney Goodman and Schwerner, the three civil rights heroes who were kind of my childhood heroes. Um, there need to be more Fannie Lou Hamer. There need to be more Ida B. Wells. There need to be um, not just um, more Paul Robeson, please, please. Um, there, you know, there need to be markers, not just of our shame, but of what, um, I once saw a, um, um, a film of Harry Belafonte playing at the Palace of the Republic in East Germany in the 70s, and he opens by saying, I greet you, I bring you greetings from the other America. And, you know, we have a concept of the other America, and, you know, we, we do need to, I mean, I could see markers, not just where people were lynched. Uh, this building was built by slave labor. I don't know enough about the history of California, but I sure know that there are plenty of buildings in New York that you could um, mark that way. Um, but we also need to remember our heroes. I just want to add that one of the things that we would do, and I think it's been done to a certain extent, but more of it needs to be done, is the this land was Tonga land and um, other indigenous peoples, and so we need markers for that. Also, um, we we know about the 1965 Watts riots, and we know about the uprising in 1992. But the first, you know, uh, mass hanging that occurred in Los Angeles was of Asian, of uh, Chinese uh, men um, in the uh, 19th century. So there's a lot of you know, um, the things that we can do everywhere um, in um, in America about what's happened. And of course, this opens up the big question about the monuments and the commemorations. And, you know, one of the interesting things in the New York Times last week was about Kehinde Wiley's new statue that's going to be on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. I used to live on Monument Avenue. My husband used to live on Monument Avenue. Walk past Robert E. Lee every day, uh, and the rest. And so it's very interesting to think that now we'll have a statue of an African American male in a hoodie with dreads, um, close to uh, Monument Avenue. So you know, some a little tiny bit of progress, but much more needed. Thank you for your question. Right. Thank you, uh, over here. Oh, David, okay. Um, so I'd like to follow up on what I think was Brenda's last question and uh, really call upon you to uh, draw upon your training as a philosopher. Um, I'm an historian like Brenda, and what we do is study events, and oftentimes in comparative perspective, but we, we rarely theorize them. Um, so one of the things I look at and work on is Israel-Palestine, and there, as you know, there has been a recent um, trend in scholarship to place in juxtaposition in scholarly conversation the Holocaust and the Nakba. Um, and this raises you know, the question that I'd like to hear you reflect on, and maybe it's, uh, in fact, the essence of chapter one, which is the question of incommensurability, the question of how you compare apples and oranges or apples and skyscrapers or whatever, you know, whatever 
uh, seems problematically incommensurate, but nonetheless cries out for, uh, for some juxtaposition and, and, and inquiry in conversation. So I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, you, notwithstanding your disclaimer about, uh, uh, about not uh, offering general rules, what kinds of methodological procedures did you begin with and what did you end up with afterwards? So, you know, is it the originating act? Is it the present day legacy or memory? Is it the fusion of horizons in between? How do you, how did you think of the compa comparison at the beginning and what do you end up with that we can learn from? Those are a set of such good questions that I'm not quite sure where to start. I mean, as far as methodology, when people were asking me, you know, and I would say, well, I interview people, I read a lot of history, I, you know, have a lot of reflections. I, was, I said, it's kind of a mishmash. And um, my friend, the sociologist Todd Gitlin, um, I hugged him for this, wrote a, um, what a blurb for the book in which he said, she's invented a new genre, investigative philosophy. And I thought, it's not a mishmash, <laughs> it's a new genre. But the truth is, um, you know, I, I did not set out with a set of um, formal criteria of any kind. I wanted to try to represent a plurality of voices on both sides of the, um, of the ocean, uh, plurality of ages, plurality of... Um, Races, plurality of, uh, you know, I think there are actually more women for some reason that I interviewed than not, but anyway, it's roughly equal. Um, so, but I didn't have, you know, I, I learned a lot in the doing of it. For example, um, one of the epiphanies that I had was, um, so I had, a, when I first came to Berlin in 1982, I had a lot of friends who would tell me that their parents were Nazis and they were ashamed of it and they were usually estranged from their families or many of them didn't go on to have children themselves, but they never told me my parents were Nazis and they thought they were the worst victims of the war. That was too much shame. Um, and you, you really have to go back and read things from the first 20 years. And then suddenly, then you ask people to say, oh, of course, that's what they thought. They said, you know, we lost 7 million people. Our cities were destroyed, the flower of our youth. Um, and then on top of it all, those damn vulgar Yankees had the gall to say it was all our fault. And then suddenly you think, wait, who does that remind me of? Right. It's the lost cause. You know, it's, it's, it's not actually that they're saying, oh, well, it would be good if uh, we were back with the Nazis. But this, this victimization was exactly the same kind of thing. And I had no way of knowing in advance that that was what I was going to find. But that wound up being very, uh, very important. Um, I mean, I, uh, I know historians and other, it's never quite clear whether historians are humanities people or social scientists. I know social scientists have clear methodologies. Um, I'm not the kind of philosopher that does. Um, often it feels like I'm feeling my way in the dark, but then something like that strikes me and it leads to an insight about how it w works. As far as Israel-Palestine, um, because uh, I did live in Israel for five years and I'm actually still an Israeli citizen, um, it is a country about which I can say something, although I'm not gonna say much. Um, I think sometimes that parallel is abused. My favorite act description um, was written by Isaac Deutscher, the historian, who compared the Nakba, or you know, the founding of the state, to 
um, a man who is uh, fleeing a burning house and jumps uh, on a passerby and breaks her legs. And he says, if both people were reasonable, they would say, oh, wow, I get it. Um, you know, both of them. And the person would say, well, I, you know, it was what I had to do at the time, but now let me help you, you know, pay for your medical costs, whatever. Um, and it wouldn't spiral into the cycle that it has now spiraled into. Um, but I, uh, I honestly don't know what to say because I have spent some time, not very much, a little bit of time in the occupied territories with uh, a friend of mine who works in a Palestinian-Israeli um, nonviolent group, basically based on Dr. King's principles, um, you know, working, working for peace, working at the moment, um, often, sadly, to protect Palestinians from attacks by the settlers. And it's, um, it's a very powerful and terrifying experience um, for somebody who, you know, does believe that uh, there could and certainly should be reconciliation between those two peoples, a just reconciliation between those two peoples. Um, I know that when I lived in Israel, uh, progressive people, you know, people from Shalom Akshav, um, you didn't set foot in the occupied territories, and that was a statement because it's not our land and we shouldn't have, you know, we shouldn't be quasi-annexing it, and so you just don't go there. But the result is that you actually don't see how bad it is. And nothing uh, that I read prepared me for how bad it was when I finally went there. So um, I wanted to end with something positive. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I mean, the, the, the problem is if you have, you know, the constant cycle of reciprocal violence uh, for a long enough time, it then gets extremely hard to imagine reconciliation. And I, you know, there are still people there working towards it. I pray they'll be successful. Hello. Hi. Right here. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I have to take us back a little bit to the negative note. Um, back, to the, back to Germany, actually, but back to Germany today. Um, speaking about the law, um, what are your views on the German um, parliament, who in 2017 passed a resolution that officially labeled BDS anti-Semitic? Um, B BDS movement, anti-Semitic, the Palestinian BDS National Committee in response said that it rejects anti-Semitism and called the resolution anti, uh, unconstitutional. Um, earlier the same, uh, this year, the director of the Jewish Museum in Berlin resigned after tweeting an article that defended BDS. I'm bringing this up because uh, this last month there's a writer uh, Camila Shamsi, who, who received a prize from the German government, and that prize was taken away from her uh, because of the similar reasons. And the same goes to uh, Walid Raad, for instance, and, and other artists, uh, artists who receive a different um, state grant as well. Uh, it did not happen in Berlin, um, and Berlin is in a lot of ways very different, but but the parliament meets in Berlin, and yeah. um, I thought it was understandable but cowardly, and my Israeli friends um, thought it was awful. Not because they necessarily, most of them don't support BDS for a variety of reasons, but that it not even be discussable um, is, I think, a mistake. And I think the firing of Peter Schaefer, who I know was a terrible mistake, 
Um, I mean, and it was done by Netanyahu leaning on um, the Minister of Culture. I mean, he called. Apparently, he calls rather often, <laughs> I found out. And, you know, because it's clear uh, that Germany is, it, it still has, I mean, there is an amount of guilt, um, but there's also, because the guilt is, is so enormous, there's a bit of a kind of fear. I mean, Jürgen Habermas, uh, Germany's um, most famous living philosopher and, and uh, certainly one of the most famous living philosophers in the world, has just said, as a German, I can't speak about Israel. And, you know, but he speaks politically about all kinds of things. And uh, I, I think that Germany ought to be grown up enough to be able to have conversations and, you know, not to fire the director of the Jew. Now it claims that there were other problems with that particular director, but honestly, he was fired because uh, Netanyahu called uh, the, culture, the federal cultural minister and said it wasn't only that... Um, that he, someone in his office, he didn't even send the tweet, but someone in his office sent a tweet, not even endorsing BDS, it was discussing BDS. Um, and uh, the other thing is that he was willing to meet with an Iranian. Well, I know Iran gets, you know, just absolutely ghastly press in the United States, and you can't possibly imagine that anything good might come out of there. But actually, Germany is rather different, and um, people do know there are, you know, it's a very large country, and there are many factions, and there's all kinds of things going on in Iran. And the idea that Netanyahu should tell him he shouldn't even be allowed to meet with an Iranian cultural minister, uh, you know, is, is outrageous. So we'll take one last question. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to uh, make a comment about the memorialization and then ask a question. I just want to say, if any of you own homes in West LA, look at your title. Look at your home title, and you will find that it, all the way back at the beginning, it bans you selling your house to, I don't know what it's called, people of Hebrew persuasion. Uh, so these are built into our, our, the histories of our homes. Just look at your title document. Um, the question I want to ask is to both of you, which is to, as both as Americans, one white, one black, um, uh, what do you think about um, uh, the relationship, one, one white Jewish and one black, uh, what about the history of the relationship between blacks and Jews, which have traversed a long distance in our lifetimes uh, from a, a relationship of, well, I can only speak as a white Jew, I can't speak as a black person, but could you say something about the relationship, the history of the relationship between American blacks and American Jews. Can I start? <laughs> uh, well, I will say that it is a long and complicated relationship. Um, it's one that in, uh, has been both positive and negative. And so, um, and then you also have to talk about different groups of Jewish people. So if you're talking about people who come in from Eastern Europe at the turn of the 20th century, you're talking about a group of Jewish people who were very racialized um, and, and often in, very much in the same ways as African Americans and the Chinese and, you know, people from Central America, and et cetera, et cetera, were racialized during this time period. Um, and as a result of that, you had, you saw early, at the same time period, the coming together of um, both Jewish people and African Americans to form certain, uh, you know, civil rights organizations. We talk about the Niagara Movement, for example, that leads into the NAACP, um, that then sparks this kind of, and then also, you know, Jewish women's groups, and as well as um, African American women's groups, um, at the same time, too, cooperating with one another. Um, we saw African-American publishers during World War II actually uh, talking about 
the genocide of Jewish people in ways in which other publishers in the United States were not doing at the time. And then you see Jewish people involved in the civil rights movement um, too, um, in, in ways that in which other white Americans were not involved in the civil rights movement. So we see this, you know, sort of back and forth and cooperation. And then we get to a period where um, you have also um, conflict, and we're talking particularly in um, in the urban areas where we have, you know, the question of um, ownership of property in which African Americans reside or work, you know, labor relationships. We have some cooperation too, of course, in the labor unions, um, also in the Communist Party, you know, um, other social and socialist organizations. Um, and but then you have the whole issue of affirmative action and, you know, um, this divide over um, that policy as a federal policy. And um, so it's, it's been a back and forth and a back and forth um, to a certain extent. There's been a lot of cooperation. There's been, at some points, a lot of conflict. Today, a l many African Americans are... Um, frustrated with the lack of progress um, of the, uh, the two, uh, two states of Palestine and Israel and feel, you know, um, that the cause of Palestine is very similar in some ways to the cause of African Americans. So, you know, have that as well. And that's played out, you know, in various sectors, um, but also at the university, at the university level. Um, as we uh, as we all know too, so you know there's a lot of, of back and forth growing up. As I said, in the segregated South, Jewish um, professionals were the people who um, actually serviced African American communities, and so that was uh, in terms of you know doctors, physicians, uh, physicians, dentists, lawyers, etc. Um, so there there's there's a very complicated and long. Um, sort of intersection of, of, of these two fantastic peoples. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that you have not just a, a black woman and a white woman here, you have a historian and a philosopher. <laughs> and I, Bre Bre Brenda Gay, I, I agree, I mean, I'm not a historian, but I, you know, everything that you said about the history, uh, I think is right. I think the other thing that's different about the South is, that African Americans in the South remember that a whole third of the white people who came down from the North were Jews. Mm -hmm. They were 2% of the population. But, um, you know, a third of, uh, a, a third of white civil rights volunteers were Jewish. And I was raised um, to, I mean, basically by my mother, who did not, again, have a very complicated theology or anything like that. But it was, you know, the message was, um, if we're supposed to say every year our ancestors were slaves in the land of Egypt, then our place is with the people whose ancestors were slaves in the land of Georgia. And, you know, that's, that's where we have to stand. I... I had to grow up and realize that this was not a majority view in the Jewish community. Um, it was, and you know, you, you, I mean, Jewish theology, if you like, I mean, this is not complicated theology, but um, you, you have that trend, okay? Or remember the stranger because, you know, be good to the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, but you also have the memory, remember Amalek, they always want to wipe us out. And I think um, Jewish people today are torn between those two very deep memories. And unfortunately, it's Amalek um, that has the upper hand right now. And so I think part of the fault is with many people in the Jewish community, by no means all, and I was really happy to meet um, a friend of my brother's in Baltimore whose synagogue went down to Tijuana to help refugees, and they did that as Jews. Um, and there were people from other religious groups there as well. Um, so, uh, I, and I know that there are many Jewish groups who 
you know, want to keep that tradition alive. Um, but I do think it's incumbent, and of, of course, unfortunately, we've had this government of Netanyahu for so damn long, uh, and he makes the claim that he represents the Jewish people, okay? Many, many, Jew I know, I know, I, I see a lot of Jews shaking their heads here, but, um, <laughs> and I feel the same way, and he doesn't even represent all of the Israelis, but because he keeps making that identification, I think particularly young African Americans who don't remember the civil rights movement, are liable to say they're on the wrong side. And honestly, um, Netanyahu and his government are just straight out racist. And not even only towards the Palestinians, towards Ethiopian Jews. I mean, they're really, really shameful things that have gone on in the last few years. So um, I guess I think it's, you know, the one thing that we can do, those of us here who are Jews, is step up to the plate and, um, you know, in one form or another, strengthen this one side of this fundamental Jewish message. Yeah, um, we are the people who are strangers in the land of Egypt and it's incumbent on us to uh, be in solidarity with other people who are strangers or minorities or oppressed in some way or another. Very well said, and that concludes us. Thank you. There are books in the back um, if you'd like to purchase. Um, wonderful new book, okay? And um, you will sign some of them. Happily. And there's yummy stuff over to the side. The book, the sale is back there, the signature's up there. Okay? All right. Thank you, Brenda. Oh, thank you. Thank you.